Welcome to the Ballet Science Podcast, where we bring science into the studio to help dancers of all ages and abilities give their best performance, both on stage and off, and reveal how the science of ballet is beneficial for everyone who moves. I'm Caroline Simpkins, a former ballerina turned researcher, and today I'm excited to share a recap of the 2025 International Association for Dance, Medicine, and Science, or IADAMS for short, annual conference that I recently attended and presented at in Las Vegas, Nevada. If you're not familiar with IADAMS, it's a global organization that brings together dancers, scientists, medical professionals, and educators, all dedicated to advancing health, well-being, and performance in dance. The annual conference is packed with cutting-edge research, hands-on workshops, and conversations about everything from injury prevention to mental health. It's one of those rare spaces where art and science come together, and it's always incredibly inspiring. This was my second time attending the IADAMS conference, and it was a phenomenal experience. In this episode, I'll first share about the award-winning presentation that I gave, and then I'll walk you through my top five favorite sessions from the conference. At this year's conference, I presented a talk titled Spatiotemporal Gait Parameters During Overground Walking in Older Adult Recreational Ballet Dancers. This project comes directly from my dissertation, which explored ballet as a tool for fall prevention in healthy older adults. I was especially honored that this presentation received the I. Adams Student Research Award sponsored by the Harkness Center for Dance Injuries. For this study, I wanted to understand whether taking recreational ballet classes could influence walking patterns later in life. My earlier research showed that young professional dancers tend to walk faster and take longer, quicker steps than non-dancers. But no one had really looked at whether those same benefits might extend to older adults who take ballet recreationally. So I recruited 43 healthy adults, ages 55 and up. 20 of them were actively taking ballet classes at least once a week, and 23 had never danced. Everyone came to our biomechanics lab, and I asked them to walk barefoot at their comfortable pace across a 10-meter walkway while we captured 3D motion data. And the results were really exciting. The older ballet dancers walked significantly faster and with longer steps than their non-dancing peers. And that's important because slower gait speed and shorter steps are linked to higher fall risk in older adults. The fact that the ballet dancers outperformed active older adults who engaged in other forms of exercise suggests there might be something unique about ballet when it comes to maintaining mobility and stability into older adulthood. This research is currently under review for publication, and I can't wait to share the full study in a future episode once it's out. For now, I will provide a link to my Google Scholar profile in the show notes for anyone who would like to check out my other publications on ballet for fall prevention in older adults. You can also check out some of my earlier podcast episodes as well. Now let's dive into my top five favorite presentations from the conference. And let me tell you, narrowing this list down was tough. There were so many brilliant speakers and fascinating sessions. But here are the ones that really stood out for me. The first is one of the keynote talks, Neurologic Dance Training, the Effects of Dance as Physical Medicine, given by Dr. Lise Worthen Chaudhry from The Ohio State University. This was hands down one of the most inspiring sessions I attended. Dr. Worthen Chaudhry has this incredible gift for blending biomechanics and creativity applying both to improve rehabilitation for people with neurological injury or neurotoxicity, such as chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, following treatment for breast cancer. She uses dance and interactive art to stimulate the nervous system, then measures outcomes using biomechanics, patient feedback, and clinical markers. What struck me was how seamlessly she translates research into interventions patients can actually use. 
she made it clear that neurologic dance training isn't just a feel-good add-on, it's physical medicine. This keynote really set the tone for the whole conference, reminding us why research in dance medicine is so essential. I highly recommend checking out some of Dr. Worth and Chaudhry's publications, so I will include a link in the show notes. They are amazing. The second presentation from the conference I'd like to highlight is Scoliosis Associated Injuries in Dance, Asymmetrical Bodies Forcing Symmetry by Dr. Chelsea Teal, a former dancer turned physical therapist. Chelsea explained that although scoliosis is relatively common in dancers, there's surprisingly little research that directly links it to the types of injuries ballet dancers often experience. In her clinical practice, she has repeatedly noticed a pattern. Dancers dealing with hip flexor tendonitis, Achilles tendon pain, or other overuse injuries frequently also have underlying scoliosis or pelvic asymmetry that may be contributing to their problems. What made her talk so compelling was the way she emphasized practical solutions. By implementing screening protocols for scoliosis and adding corrective strategies into treatment plans, things like targeted strengthening, mobility work, and postural retraining, she has seen her dancers not only reduce pain, but also recover more efficiently and return to dancing with fewer setbacks. While her observations are anecdotal and not yet backed by large-scale studies, they highlight a critical gap in our current understanding. Her work points to the importance of future research into how spinal alignment influences injury risk, performance, and long-term dancer health. The third session I want to mention was Symptoms and Perceptions of Perimenopause and Menopause in Dancers Aged 40 Plus, a descriptive study by Amanda Blackman and Brooke Winder, two physical therapists who specialize in dance medicine. This was such a groundbreaking topic because menopause is a natural stage of life that brings significant physiological and hormonal changes yet it's almost never addressed in the dance community where youth and peak physical performance are often emphasized. Their survey of 118 dancers with a mean age of 52 years shed light on both the physical and emotional realities of this transition. Anxiety, joint pain, and fatigue emerged as the most commonly reported symptoms and more than half of the participants also reported experiencing urinary incontinence, an issue that can be especially challenging in a performance-based profession. Perhaps even more striking was the knowledge gap the study revealed. Many dancers reported that they felt uninformed about menopause before turning 40, leaving them unprepared for the changes they eventually faced. That lack of awareness can make symptoms feel isolating or even frightening, especially in a culture that doesn't often talk openly about aging and dancers. This work underscores the urgent need for more resources, education, and supportive dialogue around menopause and the performing arts. By opening the conversation, these researchers are helping to normalize this stage of life and advocating for better strategies to help dancers continue moving, performing, and thriving well into their 40s and beyond. The fourth talk I want to highlight was by Dr. Jessica Aquino, who presented a poster titled A Biomechanic Profile and Comparison of New and Dead Point Shoes in Professional Ballet Dancers. Every dancer knows the feeling of the difference between brand new point shoes and those that are completely broken down. But Jessica's study asked the important question, what does that difference actually look like biomechanically? Using motion analysis and muscle activity measures, she compared how dancers performed in both conditions. Her findings revealed that dead point shoes increased postural sway during movements like releves and arabesques, indicating reduced stability, and also caused muscle activation patterns that could lead to earlier fatigue. 
Put simply, the worn out shoes made balance more difficult while also demanding more muscular effort, potentially raising the risk for ankle instability, sprains, or overuse injuries. What I especially appreciated about this presentation was its practicality. The results have clear applications not only for dancers who are constantly making decisions about when to retire a pair of point shoes, but also for clinicians who treat dance injuries and even for shoe designers who might consider ways to extend stability or durability in point shoes. This kind of work bridges the gap between science and studio life in such a tangible way. I actually featured Jessica's publication on new versus dead point shoes in a previous podcast episode. So if this topic sparks your interest, I encourage you to go back and listen to that episode for a deeper dive. And finally, the fifth presentation I'd like to highlight brought together neuroscience, music, and movement in such a compelling way. Dr. Eleanor Harrison's The Music in My Mind, FMRI to Explore the Neural Mechanisms of Moving to Song for People with Parkinson's Disease. This study explored how both external cues, like listening to recorded music, and internal cues, like mentally singing a familiar melody, influence gait and brain activity. Using functional MRI, or FMRI for short, Dr. Harrison and her team were able to see that both types of cues activated brain regions tied to movement, but in slightly different ways. External cues strongly engaged the auditory cortex, showing how rhythm and sound can drive motor function, while internal cues, like silently singing to oneself, activated the cerebellum, an area critical for coordination and timing. What's especially exciting is that these neural patterns weren't limited to people with Parkinson's disease. They were also observed in healthy older adults. This suggests that both external and internal musical strategies could be powerful tools for rehabilitation, offering flexible options for improving gait and mobility in clinical settings. The implications go beyond therapy, too. They highlight the deep connection between music and movement that dancers, musicians, and movers of all kinds already feel intuitively. For people with Parkinson's who often struggle with freezing of gait or movement initiation, these findings could inform new approaches that are not only scientifically grounded, but also enjoyable and deeply human. It was such a fascinating presentation that really captured the potential of combining neuroscience, music, and dance-inspired movement to support health and quality of life. And that wraps up my top five presentations from this year's iAdams conference. Truly, there were so many more I could have included, but these really left a lasting impression on me. If you're part of the dance world and haven't experienced iAdams before, I can't recommend it enough. I'll include a link to their website in the show notes. And yes, I'm already looking forward to next year's conference, which is being held in Melbourne, Australia. Thank you for joining me today for the Ballet Science Podcast. Whether you are a dancer, teacher, student, or simply curious about the mechanics behind movement, I appreciate you being here today. Each week, we'll explore the intersection of science and ballet, from injury prevention and biomechanics to nutrition, mindset, and everything in between. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow this podcast, leave a review, and share it with your friends and dance community. If there are specific topics you'd like to hear about in future episodes, feel free to share them in the comments below. You can also follow Ballet Science on social media and visit our website at ballet.science for additional information. Thank you again for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you next time on the Ballet Science Podcast. <laughs>